Hi, my name is Joachim Schaie. Today we will be designing and building and programming a remote control car driven by a Raspberry Pi computer. So along the way we will design and print out all the parts we need for the car and we will also be programming the software and upload it to our Raspberry Pi. So this is the final product we're building. So we printed a, a base here, and it's flat, that it holds onto both the motors and these cards here. So each card here is uh, printed for a specific purpose. This one here holds the motor controller uh, to control the car, uh, car's motors in both directions. And then this card here for uh, the Raspberry Pi, uh, either version 1 or version 2. On the back here, there's a holder for a 5 volt battery. So this is a USB standard USB battery, uh, it has a USB lead and it can be connected to the Raspberry Pi to provide it power. So this particular battery here has a button that can use to turn the power on and off for uh, to the Raspberry Pi. And on this side here, uh, we have printed um, brackets to hold onto the motors and wheels, as well as a bracket here to hold onto the battery pack for the motors. So on the bottom we have printed just a, a holder for the battery, so the actual holder is a standard 8-cell um, AA holder. We we'll printed this part here just to make sure that the batteries won't actually fall out while the car is driving. So the power from the battery pack here is fed through the hole on the side, up to the motor controller, and then back down to the motors. And each motor here on the same side, so the motors on the right side and on the left side are uh, parallel connected, meaning that they get full speed. Um, of course, then the battery only lasts half as long as if the motors were connected in series. And then when uh, the car is uh, finished and we program the Pi, it will be operated via a web browser, either on a computer or on a cell phone or an iPod or any, any other device with uh, a browser. So what we need of course is a Raspberry Pi. So this is the previous version, this is the Model B a Raspberry Pi. It has a single core CPU with a half a gig of memory. And then uh, recently the Raspberry Pi Foundation released the Raspberry Pi version 2, which of course looks quite similar. It has a quad-core CPU and one gig of RAM uh, instead, so it's quite a lot beefier. But it also has a lot more of these uh, pins, uh, GPIO pins, uh, that we can use to control electronics with. So we'll be using the Raspberry Pi, uh, and then we will design uh, a chassis for a remote control car that we will um, print out on a 3D printer. So I have built a, a RepRap Prusa i3 here. So I bought this as a kit from uh, AliExpress. Uh, and I will post the link in the description below. So this is an acryl, acrylic version. So the chassis here or the, is made of plastic acryl. Um, it looks sturdy because it's quite thick. Uh, but if I were to buy this again, I would spend the extra couple hundred dollars and get an, an aluminum chassis. Uh, just because um, the acryl is somewhat brittle, and especially some of the smaller parts. If you tighten the screws, they uh, break. So that's also a negative or a bad part of the acrylic version of the, of the printer. So I definitely go for the a bit more expensive version and get something that is made out of aluminum which are a lot more sturdy. So and when I started out this design here I went, we went through quite a bit of iterations on trying to figure out how to design uh, the car. So the first attempt First attempt here, uh, I figured I would print the chassis in one piece, so it just prints like this on the print bed, and then I would use 
holes and mounting holes for uh, for the components that would sit onto the chassis. So this one here fits uh, the previous version of the Raspberry Pi. So it fits up on top here, and then this part here is where the motor controller fits in. And then you can screw use screws and fit it into the mounting holes on the on the chassis itself on the on the bracket. Problem with this design here is that it was hard to find a place to um, to put the battery pack. Um, so, because on the bottom here, there's going to be uh, screws coming out here, so it, it was hard to find a place to put the battery pack on the bottom here. So then I figured maybe I should just move around the components here a little bit, put this in, in the middle here, uh, and then basically design a second layer where the batteries could sit on top here. And that would work, um, but then if I want to go with a module module design, because you can't print layers in one go on a 3D printer, I figured why not go all the way and just make it modular all the way. Uh, so I figured to go with something like this would be a better option. So this is the sort of platform where the car would be, uh, um, where everything goes on top here. Um, and then you can build shields or cards like this in to fit the components. So here's one for the motor controller, and then there's one like a card here uh, that fits the Raspberry Pi. So doing it that way, and uh, you can screw it in with a M standard M3 screws, then the nuts on the side here. Doing it like that way, I could put uh, the battery for the Raspberry Pi here, and then I could put the battery pack on on the bottom here. Um, by creating holes for uh, the battery packs mounting holes. So I figure we're going for a design like that and then uh, powering it with or using standard DC motors like this. This is cheap uh, DC motor. Uh, a four pack of these will run you maybe seven or eight dollars from, from AliExpress or uh, you can find them on eBay around four packs for around $12. So, so we need one battery that are that provides five volts for the Raspberry Pi. <coughs> so, um, you need to use a separate battery pack, something like that. This, which is, is a standard USB battery pack. You can use it as to charge your phone or any USB device. So this provides five volts of power uh, up to one amps of uh, current, uh, which is enough to drive the Raspberry Pi. Uh, you could use that, or you can use a DC to DC converter uh, for your main battery pack to bring down the current to five volts to for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, since I have one of these uh, handy, uh, I'd rather use one of these for the Raspberry Pi than to use the main battery. So for the battery pack, um, these motors here, um, they would need around 9 volts to operate at maximum speed. And this motor controller here, it steals about a volt or so from the battery pack, which means that 10 volts would be an optimum power for, for, the, for the motors. So that means you can either get uh, a LiPo pack with 3 cells, which will give you around 11 volts, um, but since I'm going to use this at a code club I run for kids, um, I don't really want to use lipo packs just because if they short them, it might they might explode or catch on fire, uh, and that's not really ideal in that setting. So I'm just going to use standard AA batteries, the rechargeable AA sized batteries, uh, and I'm going to use eight of them uh, to give me around 11 volts as well. So this battery pack here has two uh, mounting holes. Which means that I can, um, when I we, when we design this chassis here properly, it will have um, holes for the screws so that we can fit the, the battery pack on the bottom of the car. That means that the motors are going to have to be located somewhere around here, so down here somewhere, um, leaving enough space for the motors to sit side by side like that. So there's uh, holes for screws on the, along the side here, 
So this is going to be where the motor bracket go, and the central one is going to be where we attach a plate for for the battery pack so that the batteries won't actually fall out while you're driving if you hit a wall or, or something. So we do need some basic tools. We don't need a whole lot of tools because uh, we have uh, screws. So you either have flathead screws or uh, Phillips head screws. Um, and if you're uh, anything like me, uh, if you find a screw, the next one will have a different head. So you need both screwdrivers, just uh, a flat and a, and a flathead screwdriver. Uh, and a Phillips head screwdriver uh, or you need a screwdriver with detachable pins so you can change uh, the head of the screwdriver. Then you need a bunch of M3 sized screws and a bunch of nuts to go with the screws. Uh, you might need one of these, I'm not sure what these are called in English. So like a variab variable sized wrench, I'm not sure what they're called. And you might need a set of uh, pliers for the 3D printer uh, to get the plastic off of the extruder uh, just before you start each print. But the most important tool you're going to need while measuring up to design your parts um, is a caliper. And a caliper is a uh, uh, a measurement tool that allows you to measure in really fine detail uh, the length of uh, your items. So the distance between the mounting holes, the width and height of each component and so forth. So if you're new to 3D printing you might be naive enough like I was to figure I could just use a regular ruler uh, unless you're uh, superhuman and your vision is spot on uh, that's just not gonna work. So you need a caliper and the way this works, you can either get one that's, that has a digital display, like this one. Uh, I like this one because it's easier to read off. Um, or you can uh, read off uh, manually with uh, just uh, reading off. Uh, let me get this string. You can read off here as well. So you get the mil millimeters and inches of uh, the caliper there. So it's really easy to use if you want to measure the thickness of this nut. Uh, you place it in between the, uh, the caliper measuring area here and just tighten it till it fits in. And you can see that the width of this here is 0.2 inches or 5.4 millimeters. So I'm going to do all my measurements in millimeters and whenever I remember I'm going to press this button to show uh, the same measurement in inches, uh, which I'll probably forget half of the times. So we'll put some overlays to give the measurements in inches as well. Okay, so that's uh, all we need to get started. Of course you need a 3D printer and some uh, filament, uh, and you should probably do some test prints if you haven't printed anything before. So we're going to start off by designing this part here. So this here is uh, sort of a mini version of the of the chassis here. So this is the, the part where, uh, where the, each of the cards will go into. So we'll design both pieces so that we can uh, um, print out four of these in the series, and then we can use this to as the base of each card. Uh, which fits in here, and you can put a nut in, nut in the hole down here. Uh, I won't push it all the way through just now. Um, so you can push a nut in here, and then you can uh, use a screw to tie it in. Uh, but if you see, look at the this one here. You can see that it's uh, there's a bit of space left over. It's about two millimeters this way and one millimeter that way. Uh, so we're gonna create a part that's accurate enough so that it snaps in place, so that there's not too much room to wiggle in, in the when you insert the card. And uh, that will make it a lot easier to avoid having these cards be uh, wobbly when you drive. Um, you can screw the you can use the screws to really screw them tight, um, but even if you do that, 
it's better if it's snapped in place. It's, it's got less room to move, basically. So we'll be using a software called Tinkercad to design all our parts. Uh, Tinkercad is an online tool that's free to use. And uh, it's not a full-blown CAD tool, but it does let you design uh, parts and uh, download them in as SDL files ready for slicing to your 3D printer. So we'll be using Tinkercad throughout. Uh, I find it tool to be good enough. Uh, it has enough feature in it. Uh, and uh, it's not as feature rich as a full blown CAD tool, but the advantage is that it's just really easy to get started with. So with that out of the way, let's get started on our first designing our first part. <laughs> 